Afternoon, everyone. It's Jim here at Tutor You. Welcome to our regular uh, sort of monthly 30 minute discussion, QA discussion. And this one is uh, on T level, T level health. So I'm joined today by two Lizzies and a Charlotte. Liz, Liz on the left, our subject leader for health and social care. Liz, do you want to uh, take us through what the plan is for the next 30 minutes or so? I know you've uh, you've got a couple of expert panelists, uh, but also on some questions that have been submitted in advance. But uh, over to you and then. I'll keep an eye on the live chat. We've got over 20 people joining us live at the minute and the number is growing. So if there's any questions that come in, I'll put them onto the screen here. And also if you see a question or a comment, just let me know and I'll find it for you. But over to you, Liz. Brilliant, thanks, Jim. So yeah, tonight we're gonna to be talking about T-level health. Um, I've got with me Charlotte from Hartlepool Sixth Form College. Give us a wave, Charlotte. And also <laughs> we've got Liz from Berry College. And Hi. both of them are first uh, wave one T-level providers. So they are just about finishing their second year T-level health students, helping them through those final assessments. And they have tons of experience. They're also both joining us for our face-to-face um, -face CPD, which is on Monday the 3rd of July at the Claremont Hotel in London. So still time to book yourself onto that full day face-to-face -face CPD. And yep, Jim, you're right. I've got lots of questions to ask these guys. We could probably talk for hours on T-level health, but we'll, we'll stick to 30 minutes for, for, for now. Um, first question is for Liz. And I wanted to know what has been your biggest challenge with implementing the T-level health and how have you gone about overcoming that challenge in your centre? Probably linking the spec to how best to teach it. Um, so we looked first at holistically, so mixing all the A's together and trying it that way. But then it very quickly became apparent that it wouldn't work because it'd be confusing for students because that's not the way the exam set out. Um, so what we did, we sat down as a team, we looked at the team strengths as well, where different strengths lie. Because um, we're lucky as in we've got two science teachers on our team. So with that element was taken away and then we looked at who'd best be teach A10 and A11 and the A1 and 2 and 3. And then we grouped them all together and then dedicated three hour lessons. So an hour and a half to one to A1 and then an hour and a half to A3 and so on and so forth. Um, and that was probably the biggest challenge was to link, was to be able to link them together for their exam, but also be able to link them to staff, keep them within the core of the exam, if that makes sense because yeah. the exams four sections so it was about making sure that the sections stayed together but the best staff were teaching that section rather than just saying well as you can teach health and safety which i really don't like teaching i prefer teaching safeguarding because of my background um so we had a, a very open and honest conversation about what we enjoyed teaching and where our strengths lay as a team um right so the big thing went to one side and we focused on splitting the, it up like the exams so that each of us had a little section of the exam to teach. Right. Charlotte, how did you do it in your, your centre? Because that, that's a big challenge, isn't it? The, the spec is huge. And then, you know, how, how do you tackle it? How do you make sure you're not repeating things too much, you know, keeping your learners engaged? How have you done it? We have a quite a small cohort and a smaller team, so the delivery has been mainly myself, um, with the adding of a couple of other teachers. Um, so the A and the B completely separate teachers. So my students went up to the science teachers to be taught the science elements, and then the A elements I, I sort of taught them in a in a more of a linear sense, but um the beauty of it is is that you can sort of mix the elements up a little bit so if you wanted to you could start with element a11 which is safeguarding or then you can go on to element a5 and, and mix things up and merge things together and it all just depends on like liz says your strengths as a teacher but also going from your, your student point of view and using student voice because um elements a3 and a4 for example are health and safety very heavy on legislation and it can be quite difficult for the students to keep engaged so i merge those two together um and then planned activities in a little bit more of a practical sense to apply the legislation to practice to try and keep students engaged because it, legislation is not it's fundamental to the health sector but it's not the most exciting of topics for students 
Is there anything that you think is like the number one thing they need to know first? You know, is there something that underpins everything that you recommend, you know, tackling early on? Yeah, in terms of getting them ready for placement, I tend to do a little bit of, um, through, through induction and things, I tend to do a little bit of date protection, infection control, safeguarding, because they're all elements within themselves, but all of those topics then come into every element you're going to then teach anyway. So getting them to understand what safeguarding is and what their role is in placement, they don't have to know everything about it just at this point very, very early on, but knowing what their role is and how they have to respond because they're going into that setting brand new. The same with data protection, the same with infection control. So those underpinning things need to be quite early on, but it doesn't mean to say you have to get that whole element taught by the time they go out on placement, which yeah. I know a lot of centres do differently. Hmm. And do you do any like baseline assessment of pre-existing knowledge or anything, bef you know, right at the beginning as part of your induction? Or are we just assuming everyone knows nothing? <laughs> I tend to do a little bit of um, what school did they go to? What did you do health in, in school at GCSE level? Try and get a bit of a pinpoint, but then because of how um, particular the assessments are in T level, I try and do a little bit of presentations, a little bit of role play, because these are the things that the students are going to be assessed on. So knowledge can come in time, but those things, they, they need to know that that is going to be what they're assessed on. And if they can't face that and move past the barriers that that's going to be, it might not be that the, it's the right course for them because that is the assessment and it's not going to change. Yeah. Liz, have you had similar, I know, you know, typically at level three, there's a bit of moving around, you know, students maybe enroll on one course and then think, oh, this isn't for me. Do you, have you had that with the T level? Yeah. Um, we have quite big numbers to start with. So I think this year we started with 42 T levels. Um, but like Charlotte said, it, it very quickly it becomes apparent that if, if they're not going to be able to present and they're not going to be able to do role play and they're not going to be able to, to do them skills, then that's not changing within the T level. So we have, uh, we run a different qual as well. So we have quite a few, I think we're on, 32 at the minute for first years um which is still big numbers but we have lost quite a few and i think them exam skills as well it becomes quite quick apparent quite quickly that because it is an exam based course that sometimes that's just not right for that student so you know it's about us being an open and honest but um we do face-to-face -face interviews for T-levels as well. So we talk about all that interview so that they're able to make that decision before September, hopefully. So they know that they're stepping onto the right course. Uh, but we yeah, do have a bit. I was going to say, I suppose it's just giving them as much information as you can so that they're well informed at the, you know, the initial advice and guidance stage, isn't it? I try and make it evident through every open event, every contact I have with a student that this is the assessment. And if you fail to do that assessment, you would fail the course because this is a requirement um, just to try and yeah. make sure that they know what they're in for. OK, let's not get too bogged down with the slightly negative things. <laughs> Charlotte, <laughs> I know that we've talked in the past about some big highlights that you've had and in teaching the T-level and some things that you, you know, you think are really great about it. So if you're happy to just tell us a few of those, you know, best yeah, bits for I mean, us. The, the, the students and the journey that they go on from the starting the T-level to now near in the end, um, I haven't witnessed anything like it with teaching other, qual other qualifications. So they're not just prepared academically, they're prepared personally. I mean, they can communicate with each other. They know this this topic, the, these, these elements, the content, the sector, they know it. They don't just know it for the exam. They don't just know it for the employee set project. They know it for the rest of their careers. Um, and the way that the T-level is designed is it is embedding that long-term knowledge and that long-term understanding that is only going to be added to as they progress within their career. And it's just amazing to see how some students just completely flourish. They really do because they learn those those skills 
through the different methods of assessment and I really just any t any opportunity I have to try and apply theory to practice in I know most centres will have um, simulated living simulated uh, health areas use them because it's just getting those students up and moving about and out of that classroom environment and into that into that sector into that scenario where they're going to be working in their future and it just prepares them massively for their next steps and although that it is a challenging course the journey that the students go on is is amazing that's fabulous that's really good to hear and that kind of links what into what i wanted to ask liz about because liz and i talked a lot about preparing students for placement and liz i know that you're really passionate about building their resilience because resilience isn't something you just have you have to work on it don't you and you've done some great work with your students on their resilience do you want to tell us a bit about it yeah so we do placement slightly different so they go out for a 10-week block um within our local trust and we had lots of different placements a and e things like that and i spent a lot of time talking to them under making them understand the practicalities of although nursing's amazing you're still going to see you're going to see cardiac arrests you're going to see people at their lowest ebb um and making sure that they understand that in a way of you know it's down to you as a professional now so i treat them as professionals if they're late for my lesson they have to answer why they're late um in the beginning i used to make we have a, a simulated mannequin and i used to set her cardiac arrest alarm off if it was more than five minutes late and it would be them that I would be like you're gonna have to ring the family now and tell them what's happened because you was late for shift they're not in the uniform if you're on the ward they don't come in but they're just not allowed in i don't let them in um but for building resilience i think the best thing to do is have them open and honest conversations with them and allow that peer support so what i found absolutely amazing and i'm sure charlotte in her sense is the same the peer support they actually get so if someone has a bad time on placement they used to come in on the monday and they'd be so upset everyone else would be like it's fine do you know what we'll move on from it we'll we'll have a debrief and then we'll move on and i think although you can build resilience in a classroom i think it's that support that that surrounds them from the peers helps build it as well um and these other things like you know in the summer when they got their exam results we sat down with them and we said you know we need to move on you need to pick yourself up dust yourself off and move on and it's nice to see now at the point because it is hard work to try and build resilience into a student who who's like oh, i don't have that i can't do that and you're like no you can come on let's do it let's do it let's do it and like charlotte said that constant practice so don't be afraid to step away slightly from from a powerpoint and put them in a real life situation bring a stranger in from the street not from the street obviously <laughs> you're in. don't just go outside and go who's what popping here um, but bringing people in that they're uncomfortable with and they don't know and putting them in a hospital bed and saying right go and assess that patient go and speak to them see what's going on and giving them a bit of a brief as to like these are the questions going to ask this is how you respond because not only does it build that communication up but it does build that resilience because when they're out in placement they don't know who they're going to meet um you know i go to work as a nurse sometimes and i don't know who i'm going to meet it, it could be anyone and i think making them understand that so that's how i've done it I'd, i've not bought people in off the street i'll just clarify that i have bought them <laughs> that they've never met and i think it prepares them as well for them year two assessments when you do have to bring people in to be patients and they do have to do that questioning and that whole can we do this can we do that sort of tasks that are, are surrounding the practical assessments so that's how we built it in um but i'm genuinely not afraid to step away from a powerpoint and just teach them them skills that they need you know and if you do have simulated mannequins my favorite thing is to start someone off on a task and then make the mannequin start to crash to make them work together as a team and to build it up because if they mess up it doesn't matter there's not a patient at the end of it it's just a man it's it's a mannequin um but we're really lucky because we have cameras in the ward so we can record and then play it back on the screens <laughs> so they come sounds which is a bit awkward sometimes but um they enjoy that because then that helps them figure out what they would do different next time um as well so yeah, there's a lot of reflection in the t level isn't there so it's, it's a yeah. good good idea yeah how how do you teach reflection charlotte is it do you build it into your your like weekly 
lessons or it's a challenge for um students who are 16 essentially um Mm -hmm. because i think as adults sometimes you find it hard to reflect on what you've done well and what you can um what you can improve on next time but trying to use them some reflective cycles trying to um i have have my students keeping a bit of a log book of placement so i expect them to be every time they've been on placement tell me something that you've you've learned you've developed a skill something that you've you've done and you've experienced and how that is impacted in terms of education or skills or what else you want to know about it and then try and get them to share their experiences with each other as well um about because one student might lack confidence in one area another student might help in that sense or i've i've done that on the ward i can i can tell you about my experience so reflecting individually but also helping each other like liz says peer support um helping each other on what they've done in their area and what others can try. I see we've got a question there from Facebook. What advice and guidance would you give to someone coming new to the T level? That's a big question. <laughs> Charlotte, do you want to go first? Um, breathe. Completely just <laughs> breathe. And it's honestly not as much of a mammoth task as you might think because the content specifically in the A elements is nothing dissimilar to what you've taught in other qualifications. Um, I'm assuming that you're already um, a teacher within this sector Um, but it's nothing dissimilar to what you've already taught. It's just a completely different way of delivering and assessing and take it as an exciting challenge that you will you will get as much out of it as what students will because I know that I've developed massively as a teacher in the past two years because I'm not just like Liz says standing at a PowerPoint delivering lessons doing those mundane think pair share activities and all these tasks were a lot more practical and it's more exciting so take it as an exciting challenge instead of a barrier. Liz, do you have anything to add? Don't be afraid to think outside the box when it comes to T-levels. Um, as in, you know, you can teach health and safety all day long, but if you've got the room and you've got the equipment, make them barriers when they first walk in. Try and make it fun and interactive because as soon as you've done that, You've got the students there and, and they'll re- they might not remember the whole content, but they'll remember that lesson. They'll be like, ah, that was a time when we did this. And then try and link it to as real as you can to these scenarios that they're going to be faced with. Um, because that really prepares them for their exam because some questions in the exams are linked back to real life scenarios. Um, so to try, but to have fun and just go on the journey, just allow it to be a journey. That's probably Great. my best advice. <laughs> um, okay, good question. Is there a brand of mannequin you'd recommend? In my no, experience, we have, no. We have a Juno um, who is, uh, I love Juno. She's amazing. I use her in all my lessons. But um, I don't, <laughs> as, long, as long as you can do a blood pressure on their arm and, um, and it, fits the requirements um so as i know we can catheterize ours and you can draw blood from her you can do all sorts with her but i don't really necessarily use all of them features the main one is blood pressure um so as long as it's got an audible blood pressure then i would i would say that it doesn't really matter as long as it fits the requirements and in my experience exactly the same we have a mannequin and i would rather not use the mannequin to be honest i'd rather use another student or a member of staff or because i think it's a little bit more it's real life and if they're trying to um use their communication skills and things like that as well you don't get a response from a mannequin as much as what you would get from a from a person so to be honest i mean teachers are completely different liz obviously really loves her juno but they love juno (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but for me, um, I, I, I don't use the mannequin as much. 
Before we go into that next um, Facebook question, I've got a question. There's obviously a, a huge equipment list for T-Level Health and that can be quite intimidating. And, and I want to know like how, how often are you using the equipment? It seems from what Liz is saying that you're, you're using those simulation like tools all the time in as many lessons as possible. You know, is that what you're doing? In terms of things like physiological measurements, um, use those quite often. Um, and then we have the the beds that are obviously used um, in the hospital. I think they're handy because it just, it overcomes those barriers a little bit of when a student goes on placement, if they're already used to using that style bed and the paddles, because everybody knows you need a degree to use one of those, um, <laughs> they really can be difficult. Um, so even in how to make a bed, I mean, some of the students tell me that they don't even do this on the ward. And I said, well, you do it on my ward. This is how you make a bed. Um, but then in terms of manual handling equipment, um, not used as much um, because I know there were some changes to practical activities after some concerns. Um, but other things like um, nutrition and hydration equipment and how to assist somebody to eat and drink. It's all these things that you can cover a lot of skills in one task. So it is quite nice to have those little um, pieces of equipment and resources. But to be honest, I've sort of built up over time. It's it's not as if I needed to have everything from day one of the first day of teaching it. Um, I've just built things up and I'm just thinking, oh, well, that's handy. I'm, I'll, I'll get some of those. And it's just built up like that. Yeah, we've About been the same. So, so we've just had a brand new building built back in, well, we moved in in January. So we have a full six bedded ward bay. Um, but I'm the same as Charlotte. I don't really, I use the beds a lot. I use the OBS equipment, but the hoist, I think I've used it once to demonstrate because I'm students hoisting other students. He's just a big no-no for health and safety. Um, yeah. So I think you can build your equipment list up over time because some of the so like observations you don't need to go out and buy lots of blood pressure equipment because in reality you're probably not going to use that till year two so year one you'll use your beds you'll use the sheets you'll you know the basic nursing skills um like stuff like for us wash bowls we didn't think to buy any wash bowls so when it came to teaching them personal hygiene we had to run out and buy some some bowls so we could put some water <laughs> in and so it's them little practical things that are not on the that are on the list, but then you think, oh, I'll never use them. But you do use them more. You use them slightly more, I think, than I would. Um, you de yeah, definitely in your second year. Yeah, you, you do need, need to build it up more. your second year. But I think you know you don't have to rush out for first year and buy it all. There are ways that you can still integrate practical in your classroom without using a hospital bed or a hoist or whatever else there's nothing's coming to mind other than the heist but you you won't necessarily <laughs> need all that until year two yeah so someone's asked a question um do you have your own equipment list that would help us rather than use the one in the spec i would say perhaps that's something that the three of us could look at working on you know like a yeah. in the first year you're definitely going to need these these are maybe you know nice but not yeah. necessary and yeah, we'll we'll work on that, I think, as a team. Um, there was a question before about the ESP. I know, Charlotte, you're the ESP queen. It says what the ESP is like in terms of design or content. What's the learner meant to understand? What can you tell us, Charlotte, um, about ESPs? So I'm conscious of time because I could literally mm -hmm. be here all day with the Employer Set Project. Um, but in terms of the Employer Set Project, again, just breathe and take it one task at a time students get given 10 days to complete um four tasks some tasks have got subparts um the tasks that get marked are task one task two a no yes task two b task three b and task four um so you don't have to squeeze all of those tasks into a couple of days you can spread it out it gives the students some time to reflect in between which one of the tasks is the last task they have to do is a reflection task um make i would make sure that you are planning logistically i haven't found that as challenging as what i'm imagining liz has because i don't have as many students as liz i'm a bit of a smaller um sixth form 
Um, but that needs to be planned. You need to think about who you need to get involved. It might be that IT support because there are video recordings within that. Time for uploading and file formats. Whatever you can prepare in advance in terms of file names, etc. Then do that in advance for your own sanity more than anything. Um, and then student-wise, the students need to show progression throughout an employer set project. That's what I would be expecting to see. From the task one to the task four, I would expect the students to have been on a little journey with this patient, know exactly what this patient needs and and how they're going to how they're going to meet that patient's needs. Um I'm trying to think what else in time. Um enjoy it try to enjoy it because it's, you're getting your students to show those skills like the role play and the presentation what you'll have been working on since september so my advice as well is in your lesson delivery do the role plays do the um, presentations because it's all going to prepare the students for that employee set project and i'll i'll cut it there for now <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Charlotte. Obviously, we're doing our face to face um, CPD day on the 3rd of July. Charlotte's got a, a session where she talks us through the ESP. So do join us if you can. Liz is going to talk to us about placement. We've also got Laura from um, Wigan and Lee College. So yeah, that's gonna be a, a fabulous day. And we are working on lots of resources as a team to, to support people delivering the T level. Um, final thing, let's finish on um, some top tips so if charlotte if you could give two top tips and if liz you could give two as well for anyone that is maybe um, in the planning stages going to start delivering from september just two like key takeaways for them liz do you want to go first um, oh, sorry. oh sorry charlotte go on <laughs> um, so i would definitely say blend blend where possible so um like i said some of the elements can be merged together um a3 and a4 um a5 and a6 for example look at the way that you you're planning and delivering that because it's it's not repetitive as such but you can apply um topics together quite a lot so try and do that and then try and get the students to do research as well because that's one of the skills they need to be able to do so take the pressure off yourself a little bit blend where you can and set some research tasks where you can as well and then another tip would be just yeah just breathe <laughs> go in and enjoy the practical <laughs> side enjoy the challenge of something new brilliant thanks liz it. what are your top tips uh, mine would be to where you can make it as fun as you can try to step away from the typical classroom you're standing there with a powerpoint try and make it as fun as you can to help build them skills that they do need such as working together as a team and get over them barriers of communicating with people from different um backgrounds and things and have fun with it don't be afraid to have fun because if you're having fun and the students are having fun then learning is going to take place no matter what the lesson is some learning is going to take place as long as you remember to have fun and smile <laughs> excellent that is such good advice and it sounds like you've both had a really like amazing transformative journey on the on the t level health so i'm sure you're going to be super successful and your students will be too thank you so much brilliant thank you cheers cheers all i don't know whether have we got 30 seconds for a quick response to there's literally a late question coming about uh, the need or the importance of being a dual professional what's uh, what's our just so we've got a nice tidy end to all the the, the great questions that have been coming in what, what are our yeah. thoughts on that one charlotte I do you want to go, this go with that one yeah um, i know liz might liz might want to add on as well because i know liz is a registered professional but i was a um i was a healthcare assistant for seven years um I don't think there's an actual need to be a degree, um, degree level trained in your in your pathway, but having some industry experience does really help more so in your second year than your first year. Yeah, I agree. Um, so my background's nursing, and um, I 
bring them that knowledge from the sector to the T level and and the skills. Um, but I don't think you necessarily have to be qualified to bring them skills. I think as long as you've got that sector experience somewhere, um, I think sector experience is vital, but I don't think it's vital to be a, a um, qualified nurse or midwife or physiotherapist, as long as you've got someone with that sector knowledge that can pass that learning on. Brilliant, thanks. And uh, well, thank you, Liz, for organising the event and for getting Charlotte and Liz to join you as well. I mean, the, the CPD courses are going to be fantastic, aren't they, in a few weeks' time? And mm -hmm. um, the trailblazing trailblazing uh, centres delivering the T-levels, and in particular T-level health, yep. and learning so much and all this advice and, and practical guidance is going to be hugely useful for everybody else who takes the challenge on, maybe, maybe from September or maybe later. Many thanks to mm -hmm. everyone who's joined us live. Um, all these sessions, all of our uh, talking T levels and all of our live streams are recorded. So as soon as this session ends, if you watch on the Facebook group, the Health and Social Care Facebook group, there'll be a recording there to be able to look through and also on YouTube. What we'll do on YouTube is we'll also add some, and also to Facebook, we'll add some timestamps so that you can go to each of the questions and see if there's a particular piece of the discussion that you found uh, particularly uh, useful or interesting. Of course, it was all useful and interesting, but there might have been something <laughs> specific you want to go back to. And, uh, well, in the absence of, uh, the, I've got no mannequin here in the Tuesday office that I can go practice on, so I'm going to have to go go and have my tea now and thank, uh, thank Liz, <laughs> Liz and Charlotte uh, for joining us. It's been a really good session. We are live again tomorrow night at 4.30. I think it's health and, it's BTEC National, isn't it, Liz? Uh, yeah, yeah BTEC National. Yep. And then the day after, we're looking at the Tech Award. Uh, so mm. we've got three live uh, CPD discussions all at 4 30 all on the facebook group and on youtube so if you can join us for any of those and future sessions that would be great as well so from now from all four of us thanks for joining us